Hello and welcome to What's New in Aerospace, brought to you by Boeing. My name's Marty Kelsey. I'm an educator here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., and it is my great pleasure to be hosting this program today. Today we are joined by Hal Walker, who in 1969 fired a laser off of a reflector on the moon. Hal, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Uh, my name again is Hildreth Hal Walker, Jr. Uh, I was responsible for the operation of the K-1500 laser that completed the first interplanetary laser ranging experiments. Let's step back a little bit. I want to hear a little bit about your background leading up to the Apollo missions. I, I was involved in lasers uh, since 1964, <coughs> of course working with uh, Corad uh, Corporation, which was, was the headed by the inventor of the laser, Ted Maiman. And of course, uh, as the Apollo mission uh, started to develop, People thought the laser beam might be very important to use as an experiment so we could, again, get a better and more accurate measure for the true distance between the Earth and the moon. All right, so tell us about your role during Apollo. Uh, to, to, to be able to range to the moon, it's very important that we have a laser that's capable of developing a brightness similar to the reason why we see the moon at night, to have a brightness that would be able to be able to reflect, have energy reflected from it back to the surface. Well, this particular laser that I was operating was like uh, two or three hundred times brighter than the sun. And that means, for example, in a pulse of light that lasted ten billionths of a second, it had an intensity of one and a half gigawatts of power. That was at that time the most powerful laser in the world. Wow. Now, so Neil and Buzz landed on the surface. Mm -hmm. We see Buzz Aldrin carrying, carrying this thing around once he got out. And he, and he set this retro reflector down. Tell us what that is. We're seeing it up on the screen here. What exactly is that that we see on the surface? That device has 100 uh, reflector elements in it. The, the objective of it is to be able to point the laser reflection back towards where the source came from. And of course, we, were the, we have to see ourselves as the Earth is above the, <laughs> the reflector as we're looking at it, not the side, but on the top, looking down. But the idea is to give enough energy back from the uh, reflector that we can detect it with our light detectors back at the observatory. And we were firing this laser from Lick Observatory in Northern California. Wow, so we saw that picture of the, of the lunar retro reflector um, sitting there on the moon. And I, I wanna go back a little bit and look at that baseball video to show you where that is in conjunction with the, um, the lunar lander, which you, you can see a, a model out, uh, not a model, it's the engineering model for the uh, Apollo 11 lander. So let's check out this baseball video. In the summer of 1969, baseball fans across North America cheered as Willie McCovey and Harmon Killebrew slugged their way toward MVP awards. The Miracle Mets shocked the world on their way to a championship, and expansion teams took the field in Seattle, San Diego, Kansas City, and Montreal, Canada. The first time America's game stepped foot outside the boundaries of the United States. But on that fateful summer, Americans traveled even further to another world. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin explored only a tiny piece of the lunar surface, an area about the size of a baseball field. <laughs> Imagine the lunar lander touched down on the pitcher's mound. Traveling down the base paths, this is the view Armstrong and Aldrin saw from where first base would be. Once you get to second base, you peer back toward the pitcher's mound and see the lunar lander. Rounding third base, you would see the TV camera that captured some of the first footage from the surface of the moon. And on the way home, you would pass the flag. Yes, indeed. They've got the flag up now, and you can see the stars and stripes hey, from the winter. Flag up now. As you enjoy today's game, take note of the children in the crowd. Some of them may hope for baseball glory, but others dream of reaching for the stars. Some of the later missions covered much more ground, but that first one didn't cover a whole lot of territory, um, but it did take some incredible science. So 
they put the reflector down, you all fired the laser. Tell us what that was like being in the room and, and when that all happened. Well, Mark, I'm gonna start with watching the launch. We, 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 our hearts were just stopped. Because <laughs> we, we know inside the, inside the Saturn was our reflector and we wanted it to get there because we had pre prepared for nearly a month for this operation. But, but yes, but anyway, we, once we got going and safely in the orbit and it was on the way to the moon, we got busy then putting our final adjustments on things to get ready to shoot. And of course, uh, once uh, Buzz uh, deployed the reflector in NASA, announced to us that the reflector was uh, on the ground and that uh, one of the things we want to remember is that the, the landing did not take place in the ball fields exactly where they thought it should. And of course, we had been pointing our laser there for nearly a month. Well, to make a long story short about that, very quickly we had to adjust our operation to expand the beam on the surface, which was about a mile in diameter, so we could start to narrow it down and search for the reflector. So it took us some time to do that, but that was, that, was our, that was our job at that time. Wow, now, you're talking about the laser and shooting it off the moon and, and everything, and that, that's kind of complex. So I've, I've got a globe here, and we've got a little demo that, that I want to do um, to kind of put it into a little bit of, of perspective. So right. with the globe, one of the really cool things of, uh, that you can do in a classroom or just as a kind of a fun demo, and you're going to be hearing all about Apollo coming up this month, the circumference of the Earth is about 25,000 miles. It's about 240,000 miles to the moon. So if you wrap a string around this globe 10 times, that gives you the approximate distance from the Earth to the moon. And so we had our interns this morning actually wrap the string around the, the globe, and they really kind of struggled with it. But they got it done, and we stretched it out. And at the back of the room, we have a small moon globe back there that's about the right scale, about the right distance from our globe here on the stage. And I have a laser tape measure with me. And so what we can do is, we can actually fire our laser tape measure from here at Earth, I can hit the moon, and I can take a reading, and once I take that reading, we can actually see the distance here on, from the stage to our moon globe, and it's very similar to what you did with Apollo 11, right? Exactly, exactly. One of the things that the arranging experiment uh, is uh, used for, of course, is to measure not only the distance to the, to the uh, moon back to the Earth, but it also allows us to study the uh, interactions between the Earth and the moon as part of the Einstein's theory of relativity, which, of course, tries to understand the phenomena of gravity and so forth in that relationship. So what we were able to do with that is hopefully be able to one day trace the continental plates on the Earth to see the possibilities for earthquake research that can come to our ability to predict earthquakes in the future. Wow. Now, when you fired the laser, what was it that you were trying to see when it came back? Uh, in our case, with, uh, quickly I'll mention that there were three sites around the U.S. Uh, attempting to uh, uh, find the reflector. Our job is, at Lick Observatory was to actually acquire the location. Because again, Buzz Aldrin and Neil landed in a spot that wasn't exactly where we thought. <laughs> so we had to qu quickly search for it and locate it. But with that, we thought, okay, now that we know where it is, we can allow these other, other research uh, observatories to use that information. So my job was to operate that laser and keep it operational during the search. Were there others not in the United States trying to find it? Uh, it was called a shooting gallery. The moon looked like a shooting gallery when that was going on. <laughs> Lasers from Russia, France, anyone that had a laser was trying to find it. Yeah. Wow. And did you fire that laser while the astronauts were still doing their moonwalk? Uh, no. Uh, this, this laser, as I mentioned, was extremely powerful. And, of course, the, the surface uh, was away 240,000 miles away. But we didn't want to take a chance with that. But, again, the astronauts had departed home before we started the operations. Okay. How big do, is the laser when it starts at the Lick Observatory, and how big is it when it gets to the moon? We started out with a laser beam from the source that was three quarters of an inch in diameter. Wow. <laughs> we collimated it up through the telescope at Lick Observatory to 1.3 meters, and from there it went to approximately a, a kilometer at the surface of the moon. Wow, so that laser beam covered a kilometer, so yes. you had to get pretty accurate yes. to, to find the reflector. Well, this is what the search for. We, once we searched and using the, the returns that we were getting, we were able to narrow down the location. Okay, so 
this proves that humans were on the surface of the moon. I think Neil Armstrong mentioned that uh, a couple of times in some of his talks. <laughs> if anybody thinks that we didn't go to the moon, look at the laser reflector. <laughs> and is it still being used today? It's Well, it's still available to be used today, but about three or four years ago, after 40 years of being used, it's now uh, been, that program has been shut down. Awesome. And, and this wasn't the only one that, that flew. There were there were four total, right? Uh, there, were, there were a total of four mirrors were put down over the years, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, now, the... You say mirror. Is it? A, it's not just a normal mirror. Well, that's sort of a term we use in the business of mirror, but it's really a reflector, yes. Okay, so what's the difference between a reflector and a mirror? Well, of course, the mirror is usually a flat surface. These reflectors are a couple of flat surfaces broken into corner cubes, so we can get all of the total light to come back toward us. Okay, so it slightly, allows it. Yeah, slightly different than a mirror itself, yeah. Can't really fix your hair. No, in can't that. fix your hair. Everyone else. That's right. <laughs> So we're at the 50th anniversary. What's it like looking back on your role with the Apollo program? Oh, man. I, the, I, I think of the years I used to sit myself and one of my friends used to sit in our front yard uh, and look up at the stars and the sky and the moon and say, how can we ever get there? And uh, again, that was uh, probably in the, when I was a maybe teenager and in the early 1950s. And of course, I said, my goodness, uh, I'm standing here now looking through a telescope with a laser beam, and one of the most powerful lasers in the world striking the reflector. I was just elated. So I think it's something that you look for. So in other words, your dreams do come true if you work at them real hard. That's awesome. Now, I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen this. Um, there's an episode of a TV show called The Big Bang Theory yes. where they replicated this experiment, and they did it up on their rooftop. And my, my favorite line is, one of the guys asked, well, is it going to blow up? The laser? No, the moon. So you weren't worried about the moon blowing no, up? No, no, we weren't worried about that. <laughs> but is this something that somebody could just do in their backyard or up on, the, on their rooftop and replicate this experiment? Uh, no, not really. It's, it's, it's a little more complicated than that. <laughs> I think, number one, we recognize to be able to put a light beam on the moon has to be a pretty powerful source. But what we can do is hopefully reflectors, the reflectors will be there in the future, and observatories around to your communities and so forth may be able to integrate lasers into those systems and still use them. Awesome, awesome. Well, you've done some pretty incredible work since you, you've worked on Apollo. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about, about that. Well, again, we're looking to find the next generation of, uh, see, we were explorers. I think, is that fair to call it, Mark? Absolutely. In those days, we were, we were explorers. And, uh, I guess that's an interesting way to think of yourself. I was an explorer. I just thought it was just so good. <laughs> but explorers are usually doing something that's never been done before. But I would hope that young people in the audience, and that will get a chance to hear this, will become explorers too, because there's new places to go to. And what my example would be for them is put your hands to work, which puts your mind to work, that starts, that opens that door for you to go and do those kinds of things. Now, you started pretty young working with your hands and, and being interested in electronics, right? Yes. Um, as a young uh, guy, I was probably maybe eight or nine, ten years old, I had an opportunity to have a friend whose dad owned a uh, radio repair shop. I said TV this morning, but it was a radio <laughs> repair shop. And, of course, he allowed me the opportunity sometimes to come and sit and watch him fiddle around with these things. And electric motors were always doing buzzing or in the room. And I used to look at those sparks in there and I say, God, I wonder how, why that does that. So, of course, I spent the rest of my life following those sparks. Yes. <laughs> so, you, I, I, we were talking earlier and you mentioned a, a, a crystal quartz radio. Yes. Tell, tell me what that is and, and how hard is that to do? Well, uh, when we, once we were in high school, you know, high school kids were busy trying to get do, learn to do things with our hands. I built a little lab in my garage, let's call it. And some of my buddies and I used to build crystal oscillator radios. Well, how would you know in those days how to build a crystal oscillator radio? Well, you would go start reading something like popular science, popular mechanics, and they would have diagrams and where you could buy the parts. And so some of us in the neighborhood would build radios and talk to each other at night from our individual homes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, if you're in the audience here or if you're watching online, send us your questions on Facebook. Put them down in the comments section. If you're here in the gallery, you can head over to the microphone. Um, we've got a couple of folks standing back there ready to take your questions, and you can uh, ask them up here to Hal. Um, I've got a couple more. So. After tinkering around in your garage and, and working on that, you went into the military. Yes. 
Um, the Korean War had just about uh, got underway when I was graduating from high school. So I said to myself, if I would stick around, I might end up in the Army. And uh, I said, maybe that is not a good idea. Maybe I'll be go to the Navy. So I had been in the Sea Scouts. Oh, what the Boy Scouts, Sea Scouts? Yeah. So I was in the Sea Scouts. So I said, I'm going to go to the Navy. So I volunteered to go to the Navy. And I chose to go into the field of communication. So that got me off the ground and being involved with the Navy with electronics, electricity at that time, and systems involved in shipboard operations. Okay, and you, and you were on a ship? Yeah, yes, the USS Rendova. Uh -huh. Okay, and you told me earlier, you got to meet somebody kind of cool while you were in the military. Well, well, well yes. <laughs> while I was in the military, I, I was uh, working, for, my first job was in the security forces out on the island of Guam, and this would have been in the early 1950s. Uh, I had an opportunity to be driving for General Eisenhower, sorry, President Eisenhower at that time, who had come to Guam for some meetings, and of course I had, was the driver of the car, so he and I got to chat a little bit as we were driving along the island going around to the meeting. That's so that right. was my first visit with the President. You said your first visit, it's yeah. not your only visit. Uh, not my only visit. <laughs> I've, I've met, of course, over the years, of course, the President Clinton, and of course in South Africa, we worked very closely with President Nelson Mandela for many years. Tell me about that. Oh, wow, yeah. Uh, in 1997, my wife, Betty, she's there someplace there, are you okay? We were, we were visiting um, South Africa with us, uh, a, a number of our students, young people, and we had an opportunity to have an audience with President Mandela. And he, after hearing our students talk about shuttle launches and going to the moon, lasers, he said, wait a minute. Let me, let me spend an hour or so with these kids talking about this. He had never experienced children like this before. There's a picture <laughs> on the wall. And of course, he turned to us after this uh, discussion with these young people and said, Hal and Betty, I want you to come back to South Africa and make students like that here. We've been doing it ever since. Wow. So, so tell me about that program. Well, we have a program in South Africa called the Amen South Africa program. And just recently, in the last six months, we introduced the National Space Society chapter in the, in the city of Cape Town, South Africa, the first uh, chapter of the National Space Society on the continent of Africa. Wow, that's incredibly cool. If you've got questions, head over to the microphone. Now, Hal, I understand that, that you play a pretty mean guitar. I, I've been accused of that. <laughs> <laughs> but at, I, I understand that at some point you kind of had to make a choice. Well, I, I had a, an opportunity to be... Uh, involved in music to a, a large degree and with some of the major uh, organizations like Motown, I don't know I can Tina Turner, a group over there. And of course, I had to make that decision. To me, music was something I enjoyed and I loved, but really my passion and my heart was in laser technology and science, yes. So, so I turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you did because uh, you, you, you led to some incredible science, um, you know, shooting the laser off of the surface of the moon. Um, we've got some young people in the audience here today. What advice would you give them if they wanted to follow in your footsteps? Uh, I, I think for everyone that's uh, a young person that's looking for things to get involved in, right, to start to move toward meeting those objectives, it's called put your hands to work in it and your mind will get connected to it and that, be that becomes your platform to get started. It seems like That's you're a big advocate of, of getting in and using your hands. It's, it's important to use your hands. If you can't, it gets into a mark with what happens when something goes wrong. You don't have or use enough time to go find some other folk. You got to kind of take care of it yourself or get involved with it to the extent that other people can get to know what's going on. To do that, you got to have the ability to use your hands and get in there. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got an audience question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> I briefly did laser science, so I have a very general, hopefully accessible question for you. What do you think is the future of uh, laser computing, like photonic computers that use light instead of electricity? I'm not sure I got all of your question that was this what, yeah. yeah, what's the, I think the question was, what is your thought on laser computing using light? Oh, yeah, well, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a generational improvement and, and, and uh, the system of development and, and invention of it. So I think uh, we'll see more of that. Uh, we were, of course, uh, <laughs> again, opening the doors to laser uh, uh, operations in the 1960s. And of course, our, our systems were very powerful, large machines. For example, the laser that I was operating probably cons as, a, as a total package probably weighed close to nearly a ton. Mm -hmm. 
wow, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's amazing. Now you, so you were the team leader on this project, and you've mentioned using your hands. Were you very hands-on? Yes, of course. And one of the things that uh, allowed me to do that is that I had these skills, uh, I had developed these skills as a passion. So when I had to make a decision between working in the office or in the lab, I chose to go into the field. That's the picture <laughs> of that up on the wall. I wanted so, to see where the action was. So what are you working on there? Well, in this particular case here, in the scenes we're observing there, we were in 19... Uh, 59. This is 1959. We're building the ballistic missile early warning system in the frontiers of Alaska uh, at the uh, site there at Clear Alaska. And of course, uh, I always want to mention the folk that have never been to Alaska. Outside that building we're working in, the temperature there was minus 75 degrees <laughs> below zero. Okay. That's how far north we were. Wow. But again, our objective was to be as close to the frontiers to be able to take missiles or attacks if they were to come. Do you think lasers can be used for communication and other things for further deep space exploration? Oh, I think it's the future there, for sure. Some of my friends are now telling me about some of the wonderful things they're doing with lasers. Of course, using the speed of light as a, as the medium allows us to go over greater distances now with communication systems. So I think some of the young folk now will be able to use multi-wavelengths to get more, spec more bandwidth and those types of things. So I think that's going to be a big part, yes. Right. We've got another audience question. Go ahead. Yes. So the reflectors are still on the moon. Yes. Can we use them today? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, they, the operation physically has stopped from the U.S. side, but I'm sure there's other people around the world today still using those reflectors. They're, they're still functional. Wow. That's incredible. So we're going to head back to the moon. We're yeah. going to head on to Mars. Yeah. What experiment do you want to see on Mars? <laughs> Well, lasers, again, are being used uh, in biology experiments there to look for what? Life. And of course, what that means is they're able to examine the surface of the planet uh, using uh, uh, light to look for those elements that would, would suggest that there's a presence of some life form, a molecular basis of that happening there. So that's what we're using lasers for right now in Mars research. Awesome. All right, we've got another audience question. Go ahead. Hello, my question is if uh, you can put these uh, reflectors on uh, planets as well, or uh, you have other technology to get data, like with this technology, uh, shooting lasers. Yeah. Do you sure. have any other reflectors on, on planets or, or planning to put? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, there may be something I'm not aware of, but to my knowledge, those are the only reflectors that are on the surface right now. Yes. How big a laser would it take to hit Mars? <laughs> you wouldn't want to try that with a laser, I don't think so. <laughs> For example, I'm, I, so I'd like to go back to that question. Sure. Uh, I, one of the things that we found recently in some of the uh, uh, s ranging experiments that were conducted over the past 10 or 20 years, we found a couple of uh, Russian uh, probes that actually landed prior to the Apollo 11 landing with a mirror. But unfortunately, they landed in a crater and so their mirror couldn't get the point back at the Earth properly, so they never were able to find it. We found it for them, I think, about a year ago. And told them that. <laughs> <laughs> now, when Buzz carried the experiment out and he set it on the moon, did he have instructions on, like, a specific way to set it out, or was it oh. just get it on the surface? Oh, absolutely. It was, uh, but he didn't have to do very much thinking. It was sort of, what we, what's the word we call it nowadays, user-friendly? <laughs> it was very user-friendly, so he had to basically place it flat, and there were bubble uh, devices to tell him that, so he could push it around. And then, of course, he had to tilt the reflector head up to a certain degree that was fixed. After that, he was happy, so he, he could do that. Awesome. Yeah, there's a, there's a great picture of him carrying it out there along with yes. another experiment. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's just it's neat to see that, you know, on that first moon landing, the science was, I mean, getting there was a big piece of it, but the science was so important. What's it, I mean, how was it being involved in that science? I didn't have to spend much time with the laser reflector. Of course, my job at that time uh, ended with the reflector uh, a location. I've moved on to other things uh, in my career. But I kept my ear to the wall <laughs> and just uh, hear and read about some of the things people were doing. And of course, to be able to uh, understand that, for example, one of the things that was discovered through the laser range experience, that the moon is actually, a, uh, what's, what's the right word to call it, uh, moving away from the Earth approximately a couple of inches a year. We didn't know that before, before the laser reflectors were there. Wow, and that's, that's something that, that is important, but it's using that experiment that you worked on exactly. to be able to do that. That is incredibly mm -hmm. cool. Mm -hmm. um, 
What obstacles or setbacks did you have on your, on your path? Well, I, if I look back at the, the years, uh, if we pick those types of years, the Cold War was going on, which meant there was a lot of uh, pressure to be successful in things that we did, number one. Uh, number two, uh, we have to remember in those early days in the country there was a lot of segregation and racial barriers that had to be overcome. I chose to not attack those frontal. I put around them if I could. That was the way I got solved that. And of course, I always found if you were useful to folk, they would put some of those type of things aside. So I think I always want to say to young people, when obstacles get in your way, don't try to attack it. Go around and keep going. <laughs> if you do that, you stop. <laughs> 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 that is awesome. Were there ever, ever any failures on your path? Oh my goodness! The, the the first, I think I said earlier in another in another discussion, we fired five. I fired I fired the first five shots to the moon, and then bang, biggest bang. I probably was amplified by the fact it was happening. But in this situation, right, I heard the biggest bang ever in my life. I said, Oh my goodness, what's that? So, of course, everybody's now like, hell, what's wrong? And I said, I don't know. Let me go take a look. And I went down and found out that we had blown up part of my power supply unit. Had an arc, and, of course, that, uh, that damaged it. So right away, I had a problem called go do something about this. So I quickly grabbed the device that was having the issue, jumped in my car, sped down the mountainside, for those who have watched that, got to, got to San Jose Airport and went back to L.A., got this thing repaired and quickly got back up. Because when I got to LA, folk at the lab were saying, oh my God, how did you let this happen? I said, hey, you know how electronics are, right? <laughs> wow. But quickly take, a, take action to get it solved, get folk to help you, and get back in operation. Man, that is absolutely incredible. Well, Hal, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's give him a big round of applause. We'd like to thank everybody for coming in today and joining us and everybody that watches, that's watching online. We want to encourage you to tune back in next week. We have a giant celebration for Apollo's 50th anniversary coming up. Check out the website. There are some incredible things going on. We'll be doing some trivia here in the museum that you can play on, play along with at home. We're going to have another What's New in Aerospace the evening of July 20th, talking about moon art and art from the NASA program. Um, and there are some pretty incredible things going on on the National Mall if you happen to be in town. Um, we'd like to thank Boeing for making this possible today. Thanks for watching. <laughs>